So Hollywood, um, Hollywood is a miraculous place in the sense that it is a place is one of the few places in the world where writers can earn a weekly paycheck. It is it is an unholy union between art and commerce. Um, and it is amazing that it works as well as it does. Mm -hmm. um, if you can navigate that, if you can collaborate, if you can not take it personally, if you can understand what that business is and function there, the amount of money running around in Hollywood is insane. I mean, I, for God's sake, I mean, the writers, just, just compare the Writers Guild of America to any Writers Guild, other Writers Guild in the country, you know, the mystery writers, the science fiction writers, they've got a retirement plan and health benefits. You, it, you can, it's actually a career, you know, th that's different, man. That's very um, different. So understanding that, you understand that your scripts are not art. They're not stories. They're not movies. Your scripts are blueprints for movies. Unless you write it, direct it, act in it, and do all the special effects, you ain't making that movie. You ain't making that television show. And you don't own the script either, right? Like, you... um, well, it depends. It depends. Oh, okay. Um, okay. You can, you can, there are writers who do own their property and they're often executive producers, you know, as well. So they're part of the, the business entity that owns the, the script. But if you sell it to them, they buy it from you. You know, they, it's, it's, it's theirs unless you negotiate otherwise. The thing for you to understand is that if the average movie costs $30 million or whatever it is right now, you're talking to the money people. If you don't want to talk to the money people, if you don't want to satisfy them, you don't want to do what it is they want to do, make your own damn movie using your money and go broke. You'll be living in a cardboard box before you know it. Mm -hmm. um, nobody uses their own. Oprah doesn't use her own money to make movies. That's a, that's a mugs game. So if you go to somebody and say, please, sir, I'd like $30 million, you better believe they have the right to say, to give you an opinion about what you're doing. Now, if you've written a book and they want to film that book, you have an option. You can say no. You can say, I want to write the script. You can say, I want to be an executive producer so that I have some say over what's going on. And the more they want your book, the more they will give you in return. But I would suggest, I remember one of the suggestions I got about Hollywood early on, I was working at CBS 7800 Beverly Boulevard in Hollywood, um, working on the prices, right? And stuff like that. All in the family, Maude, Mary Tyler Moore show. Anyway, um, one of the executives there, I, I asked them about how much I should charge for a script that I, I wanted to sell some people a script. They put out an open call for scripts. And what she said to me was, it doesn't matter how much money you get, just get in. Take whatever you have to take in order to get into the business. That first one, if you have, if you have any confidence in your ideas at all, you know that you're going to have endless ideas. Ideas are cheap. Execution is hard. Exactly. You know, I totally agree with that. Sorry. You know, it's, it's. <laughs> God, if you're like, I've got this great idea, you write it, we'll split the money. Oh, you know, yeah, go please. away, right? <laughs> go play with yourself. You know, it's just like, you know, how about you write it and keep all the money? Um, the To be on the outside of Hollywood is like being a virgin, okay? Once you're inside, you understand that's a little bit more precise. <laughs> I anticipated it's a little dirty. It's a little it dirty. feels it's completely little different filthy. than you thought it was I going the, to. I, I, <laughs> it's a little filthy. I, I get it. I get it. You, know, you had you know, me. You had me the virgin. I, I got it. All, all those, <laughs> it, it like, it, <laughs> like a virgin filmed for the very first time. Anyway, like nanoseconds, all the permutations of coming. That's right. That's right. And I'm like, I get um, it. <laughs> yeah. Ideas are cheap and nasty. Um, so what you think it is to write for Hollywood is not what it is. You know, the thing is what it is. Your concepts of the thing are not the thing. What you want is for somebody, it's like being published, you know, getting, getting across that line of having a story published. Getting on the other side of that is a whole different world of excitement and disappointment. 
-hmm. You know, you expected to meet people who were walking gods and genius. And what you find is people, they're smart people, but they're just people with the same foibles anybody else has, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about the editors or the agents. And the agents and the editors are not monsters. You know, if you became an editor agent, other writers would complain about you the exact same way you've been complaining about them. The same thing is true in Hollywood. You know, producers and executives are not monsters. If you started your own studio and, and writers came to you looking for your money, they would complain about you the same way you used to complain about the guys at Fox. It's the position that does it. You know, growing up, and I'll never be like my parents. And as soon as you have kids, you find yourself saying the exact same crap your parents said because you now understand. So if you can like there are some there are some things i had to learn about Hollywood. let me just pull a couple of things in out, out of my out of my butt one of them is that in general when an executive gives you a, a suggestion for a script they don't want you to do what they said they want you to do something that feels somewhat like what they said but excites them and surprises them they want you to write something that what they think they would write if they had had the time to develop the skills that you have. So they're asking you, they want you to thrill them. They want you to excite them. They want you to make them remember why they're in this business because they love story. For most of them, it isn't just a matter of making as much money as possible. It's a matter of making money doing something that they enjoy. When they make a movie and it works and they get to walk down the red carpet and they sit in the theater and people are cheering and laughing and, 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 and gasping, it feels great. Even these stone faced executives, they love it, but that, you know, it, it, they have to be hard cases. And if you can understand that they're just, they're just people like you and they want to be excited. They want you to thrill them. They want you to knock their butts in the dirt. You know, where they say, wow, you know, wow, now that's a story. They're looking for that. So that's one of the things, you know, so in a story meeting, you have to know when to hold, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. You need to know when to say, I will not write that. Most of the time you're going to say, okay, um, can, you need this, you know, how many producers does it take to change a light bulb? You know, does it have to be a light bulb? I mean, to understand that the production necessities or other things they have coming down the pipeline or their personal taste, and some of them are idiots, but it's no larger percentage than idiots in anything else. The the opening bid to get in to get a job in Hollywood is probably a law degree. I mean, these are smart people. They're not stupid. This is a difficult, difficult business, and everybody's fumbling in the dark. People who can replicate success from one project to a the next, they're going to be they're going to make top dollar. You know, it's all in the, you know, can you, can you deliver butts and seats? So that's, that's one thing or a little cluster of things. Another thing is if you've got five executives who are, are working on a project, the way I put it is it's tough in the same way that if you have a glass of beer and you spit in it, that eh, beer still tastes pretty much the same way. But if you pass it around the room and everybody spits in it, by the time it gets back to you, it's more spit than beer. What you have to do is find a way not to gag. They're all going to have their thoughts. Right. And what you have to do is to acknowledge their input without necessarily taking their idea. That they know you respect them, but you're like them you know i i changed this over here but this over here this needs to be here and this is why you know why you're going to stick to your guns um but assuming that you've got you know let's say i'm trying to get a script it's one of my very first scripts or i really want this job and there are three four people in that room and they're all saying things and sometimes the things aren't exactly the same that is like threading four moving knitting and four moving sewing needles that you have to find a way to get the thread of your story and make everybody in that room feel invested your ideas are there your ideas are there your ideas are there your ideas are there but in truth you ignored all of them and you're following your heart if you can do that you too can have a career in hollywood <laughs> There are other fields that are shockingly very similar to that. I would imagine that in some ways, almost every field is. If you want other people's money, you have to satisfy them. 
If you don't care about their money, then you don't. You write short stories, you send them out. If you want it, fine. If you don't, screw you. You know, Harlan Ellison was much like that. He could have had a much different career in Hollywood if he had not had an extreme sense of this is who I am and I, and this is where I stand. And he built himself a fantastic life in many ways, but he never got that Oscar. He never wrote a movie that he was proud of, a lot of television, but he couldn't compromise. And he had the talent and the skill to be able to build a meaningful career with far less compromising than most of us have to do. You know, most of us are not that. There was only one Harlan. Uh, and Harlan was the most himself human being I think I had ever met. He just was who he was. You know, you could de deal with it or not. He had a, a plaque on his door. His house was called Ellison Wonderland. It said, said dig or split. Did that he was have him. some confrontation with Frank Sinatra at some point? Yeah, at a pool room. Um, <laughs> yeah. With Frank Sinatra, wanted to use the pool table. He basically told him to screw off. There was some sort of uh, an implied intimidation with Sinatra's bodyguards. I think Sinatra was enjoying being mobbed up at the time, I think. Yeah. Um, but Harlan wouldn't back down to anybody. And ultimately, you know, it blew over. The, the story's been told several different ways, so it's hard to say exactly what it was. There's one version where you know, they took him out and, 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 and beat him up or something like this. But I don't, you know, I think that what happened was that Harlan stood his ground and that um, Sinatra respected that, you know. Um, Harlan was the real deal. And he, he was, he was a Hollywood personality working in the New York publishing industry, you know, science fiction being primarily, you know, kind of New York publishing. So that was the explanation for his enormous charisma. He had that Hollywood thing, you know, um, an amazing guy. And I loved him dearly. And it was, I was honored to be his friend. I did not expect to be able to be friends with him. I've, I've had a fantastic time in my career and uh, there are things that I haven't been able to do yet and I'm still working on them, you know? Anyway, on to the next question. So tell, a little, tell us a little bit about horror noir. Speaking of things that you're working on. Okay, so been... so my good lady wife, Tanana Reeve Du, um, was brought aboard a documentary on black people in horror movies and in horror movies that deal with black people. Um, and they did a documentary with people like Tony Todd and, and, uh, um, just, you know, many, many other, uh, black, uh, actors and directors, Jordan Peele and so forth and so on. And that was on, uh, Shudder, I think. Yeah. And then Shudder did a co-production with AMC to do a, an anthology of black horror, uh, short pieces. You know, like Tales from the Hood, or 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 you know, there've been there've been several, uh, there've been several such anthology films, and they decided they wanted to do one. So they there were six episodes, each of them between twenty and thirty minutes, um, about thirty. We call it about twenty five minutes each, and uh, we in, we got one of them based on a short story that she wrote called The Lake, and so we wrote that, and then one of their one of their scripts fell through. I don't know exactly what it was that happened. And they got in touch with us and said, listen, we'd like another, you know, can you do another one? So we already had, we had a family vacation set up, but you know, my attitude was hell yeah. yeah. You know, I can, I can work while I'm on the road, no problem. Um, and so we, we got a second one called uh, Fugue State, which was kind of fun because Fugue State was based on a story that we wrote to teach students. Basically what happened was that our students um, in, in an online course that we were doing gave us story prompts. And two of the story prompts were politics and religion. And I decided, I believe that those were the prompts. And I said, you know, and that sparked. I said, the things you're never yeah. supposed to talk about at work, right? Well, you know, um, <laughs> they're, they're interesting in religion and politics. Um, right. Both of them are very faith based, ultimately. Um, but I, I decided that, that it would be possible to do something that was good about that touched on why is it dangerous when religion enters the political sphere. Um, and 
so I wrote the story and we linked people to a Google doc where it was being written so they could actually watch the story as it was being developed. And then we sold it to Lightspeed, I think, or Apex, one of those, one of those, one of those uh, magazines, online magazines. And then they bought, and then AMC bought it. And so I adapted it to television. So we've got this record of this story from an initial concept all the way to it being on television. So that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure how many times that's ever happened. And one of these days we'll create some sort of a document that, that links all that together. But um, it was quite the experience. I, Tanana Reeve took the lead on the lake. I took the lead on Fugue State. Now you always know who takes the lead on one of our projects by whose name comes first in the title. Mm-hmm. You know, So the Tennyson Hardwick mysteries that we did, she wrote the first draft. So her name comes first in the title. The, devil's wake young young adult zombie novels that we did together i took wrote the first draft so my name goes first um but it was a great experience and uh, i'm very optimistic about what might come out of that um i'm still waiting to see how this year is going to develop work wise you know uh, things shut down after thanksgiving pretty much in hollywood and then it takes you know about 50 days to rev it back up again so we will see by march i should have a pretty good idea of what kind of work is going to be happening this week and you know luckily there's enough in the bank that i'm not terribly nervous about it. although in about 10 weeks i would be getting nervous <laughs> yeah that's so I, I did a previous interview with a former hulu executive and that's one of the dynamics in hollywood i, I asked him about uh, and I think on a prior one of your prior podcasts or uh, life writing episodes, you've mentioned this too, is that one of the things you need to do, it, it's very, well, I shouldn't say need to do, but it's very important that you live in Hollywood. Yes. I think you had left, but I, uh, talk about that. Yeah, story. absolutely. You know, I, I moved up to the Northwest because of some family issues. And for about a year, I was still able to work in Hollywood. I could come down and take meetings and do that. that. But, you know, frankly, you know, the jobs go to people who you go to parties with, you see them in the restaurant, you, you know, you, they can, they can take meetings in a hurry, you know, and so forth and so on. And I think that, that Zoom and the pandemic has changed that. I think that, that, that it will be much easier for people to not work in Hollywood, but still stay connected because of, of virtual technology. Um, but yeah, it killed my career. Um, and by the time I got back down to Hollywood, there were some important ways in which I'd aged out. You know, I, my agent told me not only was he retiring, but that in the time I'd been gone, which is about 10 years, uh, there was no longer any freelance work in Hollywood, that it was all done by, by story rooms and they didn't hire anybody for story rooms over 40. And I was already over 50. So I was screwed. And that was a terrifying moment and it took me six years to a very very careful chess playing and keep tamping down my fear to to work my way carefully back into the business and then my mother-in-law contracted cancer and we had to move to atlanta to to hospice her and it was i was heartbroken i mean you know yeah this is the family emergency and you do what you have to do but it was the death of dreams, man. I I could not see any way to get back on the horse. But what happened is that while we were there, we decided to make our own short film, which people can see. We we crowdfunded, you know, $30,000 to make our own short film. And and we, we, it's like a 15 minute zombie movie. Uh, they called Danger Word, which you can see at DangerWord.com. It, it, it's available for free on YouTube. Um, and doing that taught Tanana Reeve some things about film production that helped make her a better writer. And it also, when we came back to Hollywood, we came back slightly different. We were producers, not just writers. So we, it's not, it, it's, if you draw a tiny circle, it's the same as drawing a circle the big, as large as the earth in terms of the geometry. If you make a tiny film with real actors and real camera people and this, that, and the other, even if you make it on your iPhone, but there's, you know, you are different than if you've never gone through that experience. You understand things different. And this is one of the things that we actually advise people to do. There's a book, there's a course called Dove Simons, D-O-V-S-I-M-O-N-S, three-day film school. And he says something, you want to know how to make a $50 million movie? 
Make a $5 million movie. Want to know how to make a $5 million movie? Make a $500,000 movie, a $50,000 movie, a $5,000 movie. And then you get all the way down to a $50 movie shot on your iPhone, buying donuts for the people, for actors at the local junior college or just your friends. And you make it as proof of concept. You, you write a one act play in one room and one set and you just film it. And then you edit it together using free software you can get online and you put it up on YouTube. Proof of concept. You say, this is what I did for $50. I'd like to raise $500 to make a better movie. And if you did something that was good, you'll raise that $500. And if you can do something good with that and you learn, you'll get $5,000, $50,000. And at some point, Hollywood will say, er? the people have gotten multi-million dollar deals because of little cheap movies they did and put it up on YouTube. There are ways in which the, the field is more open than it's ever been. Um, people complain about, you know, oh my God, Hollywood's doing nothing but, 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 re, but, you know, remake. That's nonsense. That's idiocy. There is more original content being made now than in any period in world history. There are, there, when I was a kid, there were three networks. Yep. How many networks are there now? I couldn't even tell you because there's, that's hundreds. right. You right. can't, you know, right. there are so many of them. There is, there is broadcast and there's streaming and there's cable and there's direct to video and there's there's DVDs and Blu-rays and there's there's you know, uh, major releases and minor releases and, and all this different stuff. And it is a huge market, vastly hungry. You just have to learn how to play the game. Understand it is a business, not expect people to think you're a super genius just because your parents did. Anybody can dance in the living room and make their parents and aunts and uncles happy. Oh, look at you, are so talented and throw you a dime. Once you get out your front door, it ain't that kind of party because everybody on the block thinks they can dance in the living room and earn a dime. Mm -hmm. If you want to stand out in that crowd, you better bring it. You better, the kid part of you wants to do the art, but the adult part of you has to do the business. You know, you better have a part of you that is as serious as cancer about marketing and sales and pitching you know, and yeah, you'd love it if people just took your work and did beautiful things with it and gave you a dump truck of money. Wouldn't that be a nice, but it ain't that kind of world. It ain't that kind of world, but it is a world in which people who are willing to be adults can be artists. You can be a big kid if the adult part of your personality creates a safe space for that child to play. So, you know, I, I can't, I can't say enough that, that you can have that creative life but there's a price to pay and if you want to find out what that price is you find people who are living it and you ask them you don't hallucinate that you understand what this business takes you ask and you you study and you decide what is the price they had to pay and you decide whether you're willing to pay that price and if you are then get in the game and I hope things work out. I'm going to have to call this, you know, I've got to get onto another Zoom, but it's been very nice, Sean, and perhaps another time we can continue the conversation. Yeah, and especially offline too. I'd love to meet with you and, you know, next time I'm down there or you're up here. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Stephen. You're very welcome. And you can find us at lifewritingpodcast.com. Comments, yep. Take care. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.